I guess uh, I'll start off. Uh, my name is Dan Tischler. I'm sort of the co-organizer of our virtual and outdoor fungus fair that uh, is the replacement for our indoor fair for a couple of years. Hopefully next year we will have a big indoor fair that we can enjoy rain or shine. Hopefully uh, rain beforehand and shine during the event. But we have five uh, lectures and this is the first one. And I guess I'll turn things over to, to Christian to do all the, all the introduction. Yeah. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, I'm. Where's that? No, long. It was more recently than that. But first met you up in Oregon and um, touched base about, I guess, what you were starting then um, was the group of folks at Evergreen who undergraduates were interested in in mycology and wanted to sort of get to know each other and get out in the field and have opportunities to learn about it, sort of the way I and then you're breaking up, Christian. What's that? You're breaking up. Oh, sorry. Can anyone hear me now? Yes. Okay. We well, heard the you is, say we met and you said you, we, I was trying to get the club going and you similarly had been gathering people to do things like that. Yeah. The point is when I was up in Bellingham this fall, Lauren showed me some of her slides um, and I thought they were extremely interesting and I really wanted to see them be a part of our fair this year. So I'm glad that Lauren's finally here. Um, I will turn it over to you, Lauren, to tell us about the fungi of Trinidad and Guyana. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Christian and Dan. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be kicking off the 2023 fungus fair. Um, so let me get sharing here. Hopefully slides will work OK. And actually canceling it for one second so I can minimize people. Okay. I wish I could see everybody while I did this and have to get another screen set up. Okay. So mycology in the tropics. Can you guys hear me and see the screen good? Okay. Yes. This like sideboard thing keeps popping up. Sorry about that. Just, Zoom is so weird. All right, stop share. Good. All right, fungi of Guyana and Trinidad. So just a brief overview of some things I'll be talking about. Um, an overview of some of the research projects that I was involved with and kind of some tidbits on the trip to Guyana and then Trinidad. Field sites and data collection. Um, some of the more commonly observed groups of fungi that we were seeing, and some other interesting organisms, non-fungal. And then, if we have time, a few very short trivia questions, just recap, and some resources. All right, so uh, most people don't know where Guyana is and maybe had not even ever heard of it, and I hadn't either before I heard about, a, you know, Kathy Ames' research. And so here's a map. You can see the little map up on the top. It's in the south, northeastern um, part of South America, kind of along the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean side over there. And it is not to be confused with Ghana, which is in Africa, or French Guiana. Um, yeah, French Guiana is neighboring, but was colonized by different um, people, including the French and the Dutch. And yeah, Guyana is a pretty small country. It's the only country in South America that has English as the national language. And so 
that was nice and helpful. It's also, uh, there's a very heavy dialect and accent. It's a lot of like Creole mixes, different influences from different regions of the world. Um, and so it takes some getting used to. And usually everybody can understand the American accent, totally fine. But getting, you know, on the other side of it, it, it definitely, you got to ask people to repeat themselves a lot. Uh, but it was really cool to go to this new part of the world. I had never been to South America before. Um, this country has a very small population too. I think it's the second least populated in South America after French Guiana or after Suriname, one of the two. And it has, or it had in 2020, 786,000 people, 559 total in the whole country. And so, and they're mostly populated in Georgetown along the coast there, which is the capital. Um, it has really well intact uh, rainforest compared to uh, other neighboring regions, Brazil, you know, the forests bleed in the Amazon, the inner Amazonian region, but they've lost a lot of forest, of course, and um, Guyana's had pretty decent holds on preserving um, some of their environments. So it is at risk, always. Okay, let me see. Here's, uh, I gotta not ramble too much because there's so much to say. Uh, here's our our team. This was the 2021 to 2022 team. And I'll mention some more people in detail in a little bit. Um, but we have Dr. Kathy Aim down the bottom. Um, next to her on the right is Alexis, who is a student at the University of Guyana. Um, another former student of University of Guyana, all the way on the right, Delon, who is getting her PhD at University of Purdue. And then our two native guides, who are brothers, Luciano and Sego, who uh, Luciano's sitting on the rock and Sego standing up tall. And then Terry Cruz, who is a Costa Rican researcher at Penn State. And then my partner, Jack, who is um, wonderful. And I have a lot to thank to him for helping me get on this trip. Uh, he'll be doing a talk tomorrow, quick pitch on uh, cryptic niches and unusual fungi. So go on to that. And then there's me there too. All right, so uh, Dr. Kathy Aim is who I, she uh, is the leader of all of this research and she's the one who I got to go um, join her team. And she's a renowned mycologist and one of the coolest people I've ever met. Uh, she goes out of her way to help people who are curious about fungi. And Jack and I were not her students, nor were we grad students, but uh, Jack had reached out to her trying to get more experience in field mycology. And out of her thousand emails a day, she, uh, she told us that she saw his and was willing to give us a chance and um, to come and help, help out as, in as many ways as we were able to. And so she is an international expert on plant pathogens, fungi that uh, attack important agricultural crops, a lot of rust fungi, smuts, um, endophytic fungi. And she also, with a lot of the grants that she's received, been able to study more general fungal diversity, including that of the Guiana Shield, as well as uh, Gondwanan fungi, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, and she's collaborated a lot with the University of Guyana and their Center for Biodiversity. Uh, and every time she goes on a trip down there, which she's been doing for over 20 years, she brings a student, if there is one who is interested from the University of Guyana um, for free and covers all of their, their costs so that they can get an in-depth uh, field experience. So here's this website. I really recommend checking it out if you like this kind of stuff, tropicalfungi.org. And uh, this is kind of highlighting on the map here, like when we had these supercontinents, um, the Gannon Shield, and then the um, forests on the western coasts of Africa, kind of, you know, we're all connected and we're trying to see what the fungal diversity is in these two different areas and how much overlap that there is. So part of the research we were doing ties into that, but um, Terry Hankel at um, Humboldt runs this website. He's got research, they've collaborated a lot together and he's got also ongoing research down there um, and also in Africa. And so they're just kind of trying to paint a broader picture of geological history and how that impacts uh, modern fungal populations. 
And there's a lot of cool website uh, photos on this website, like little galleries and articles, um, publications. And so if you like are just wanting more than what I'm telling you, definitely check it out. Okay, so here are some of the new genera of tropical fungi that um, Kathy Aim has described. So this is from her lab website. So there's tons and tons of new species, you know, and that's something that people are starting to get more familiar with. We say, oh, we have undescribed, someone found an undescribed, you know, hygrophorus or Cortinarius, but not as often do we hear new genera being described to science. So here's just like kind of an impressive spread. And this isn't even all of them. This is just kind of an older snapshot of some that Kathy has 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 written up. She publishes a lot. And so if you go on ResearchGate, you can see some of her thousands of papers, including um, these new groups getting described to science. Is that cool, Guyana? Guyana gasters. Oh, this is so cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So here's one of the uh, projects that I spent a lot of time helping collect data for. And this is a project um, looking at Fusarium Zyrus interactions. And I'll tell you more about what those are. But um, this is Terry Torres Cruz. And she's a Costa Rican researcher getting her PhD at Penn State. And she was so kind and helpful, taught me a lot about um, collecting data in the field in these really extreme conditions. It was super hot every day, um, humid, and uh, she was very patient with us. So I'm, I'm very grateful that I got to assist her. And she is investigating interactions between fungi, plants, soil, and insects, all in this kind of um, system of cyrus plants, which are in the greater grass origin poleales. Um, they have their own family, Zyridaceae, um, and they make these really beautiful yellow flowers in these kind of nutrient poor, well-drained, um, wet spots. And they have a fungus that creates a pseudo flower. And I will show you that here. And so uh, fusarium are not really known to do this. This is the only fusarium species that is known to science to create this structure on a plant host that is mimicking the flower of the plant. And so you can see them side by side here. Zyrus surinamensis is an um, endemic Zyrus plant and Fusarium xyrophyllum is the um, fungus that will grow on the inflorescence, um, inflorescences in the buds of this plant. And so up close, you can definitely tell the difference in that they look, you know, not um, the same, but when you're, they're not that big. Um, and so when you're standing up, kind of even just that, like you're not squatting, you're standing up looking down at them, uh, they definitely look very similar. There are very subtle different shades of yellow. Um, and then the actual structure itself, we have obviously the true flower on the left and then this kind of fluffy cottony um, rosette uh, on, the, on the bud there. And let me just pop on my notes real quick because what I wanted to say was that Fusarium, they are known to be plant pathogens worldwide. And they're actually considered to be agricultural pests on a lot of different crops, bananas, nightshades like tobacco, tomatoes, um, and legumes and sweet potato. And so they're very well studied and they it, it comes up as contaminant often. So if you're sequencing different things, they were actually the way that it was discovered that this was happening was not even in the field. It was through an herbarium specimen that a botanist was trying to look at the xyrus and was sequencing the plant tissue, but was getting fusarium back. And it was just considered to be a contaminant because that is just something that happens a lot when, you know, in the lab, the fusarium is a com common contaminant. And it they had to do it like three or four times and they kept getting fusarium and they were like, something's going on here. And, and they went back and looked at these specimens and saw, you know, this tissue is a little bit different. And so uh, after that, this kind of sparked a new, more modern research. Um, th those are barium specimens were from like the 60s. And so this species of um, Fusarium was only described a couple of years ago. And there's a lot that's unknown about it. So Terry's trying to figure out 
uh, how does it work? What's the life cycle of this fungus? Um, Because these are asexual conidial structures that we're seeing. Um, And you could see more comparisons here of the true flower and the pseudo flower. Um, And so does it have a sexual life cycle? That's not super common for Fusarium, but does it? I don't know. Um, Is it, how is it being um, transferred? Is it being, you know, transferred to the plant? Are there, is it trying to attract uh, pollinators that would normally go to the Zyrus? Um, But the thing was, Zyrus was thought to be wind pollinated. So why would this fungus mimic a flower, um, you know, that, like, why would it, you know, why would I I'm getting lost in my words, but it's like, why would it mimic? Usually this happens, other fungal pseudoflowers, that happens when we're seeing, um, it's mimicking a flower that specifically draws insects. And the the fungus will even modify the plant to make this kind of nectar. It will use plant sugars to create nectar. Um, to, and then the insect will come and um, get pick up on fungal tissue and, and spread it that way. So all in all, Terry is wondering, you know, why, how is this getting spread? Why is, why is this happening? Um, is it giving off any aromatics that, uh, so my other slide, I'll, I'll talk about the aromatics in a second. But anyways, there's a lot of questions here, you know, what are the, what's the insect role? What's the life cycle, um, et cetera. So here's just like one of, one of the few research sites that we had. Uh, they're really, like I said, nutrient poor spots. Uh, there's a lot of flooding and draining and in these like sandy plains, a lot of grasses and the, some of the habitats intact, but a lot of it's been degraded and is kind of slowly rebuilding um, towards the coast by kind of by the city there. Um, but a lot of the natural white sand that you'll find all throughout the region is actually coming from the Guyanan Shield, which is considered to be one of the Earth's oldest structures. It's about 1.7 billion years old. And it's you can see pictures of it and some of the waterfalls of this like kind of solid mass of land that just drops off. And as that degrades, it kind of fills the, fills the lowlands with this white sand, um, which produces all different kinds of interesting diversity. Um, and let's see, here's just some, uh, data collecting in the field, uh, up in the top photo, uh, you can see Terry and Alexis are setting up an aromatic, um, trapping device and it's pretty simple, uh, machinery, but it's basically we're, um, encapsulating either the fungal pseudoflower or the true flower and pulling the air through, um, using a pump through a filter that will then get stored and run through um, like a, a, what is it, GCMS, just kind of like spectrometry, (laughs) God, my science terms. It's going to get analyzed and we're going to be able to see what, uh, you know, what are the compounds that are being released into the air from both uh, organisms here. And uh, there's just kind of a picture of me wading through the pools. There's just so much water. Uh, it's a lot of sloshing around and you need high boots. Um, otherwise you will suffer. Um, and then uh, there's Jack at the bottom uh, going along a transect. So we just kind of lay out these long multi-yard um, measurement tapes and then do a couple of different series of counting plants, counting pseudoflowers, counting if they're dead or not, uh, how many dead, how many live all different kinds of um, counting there. And it takes some persistence in the heat. But we did lots of different methods to just kind of get as much information that Terry could then take back and analyze as possible. Uh, She also collected soil, uh, like full plants and also soil samples as well um, uh, for sequencing. uh, I think she was doing, doing genomics. She was doing microbiome sequencing. So trying to see like what organisms are there yeast bacteria living like within and on the outside of the, of these plants, as well as just um, sequencing of all the organisms just to kind of make sure we have a baseline of the uh, host and whatnot. All right, here's some sites from the sites. There's some cool stuff, um, some Drosera, the cool sundews, uh, some of the uh, Cladonias or Cladina, the reindeer lichens. Uh, and sphagnum. So these are all like kind of, you know, things you can see up in North America and Western North America and uh, in, in wetlands and um, 
fens and whatnot. And so it was cool to see that down there, some Melastomataceae flowers, tiny little toadlets. They were, so that little baby frog was smaller than an ant. I, I don't have a side-by-side -side comparison here, but I swear to God, a large ant walked by and the baby frog was smaller than the, than the ant. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we got dragonflies. They were everywhere. It was crazy. And lots of tadpoles. Uh, dragonflies, damselflies and bladder warts, all kinds of cool plants that I, were very new to me. Okay, let me check what time is it. Okay, I got plenty of time. Uh, the Rupununi savanna. So this is really cool. This is inland. Um, so we drove for several hours on specialized vehicles that um, have to be modified to take you on these muddy roads, the only road that you can take um, from the cities through to this part of the um, interior of the country with that is a lot more forested but then the forests break into these cool natural savannas and there's giant ant ears and stuff I didn't get to see one but I heard that there was one by that people saw locals recently I'm hoping to see one real bad there's Terry collecting some some stuff down there um and yeah there was a bunch of just these I think this right here if not nearby there were mang um cashew trees and so I got to see the cashew fruit and the nut forming um, and just beautiful habitat then that was uh, one of our field sites as well okay so we spent three weeks in the interior rainforest along the Essequibo River at the Iwakrama River Lodge and Research Center and um, yeah it was a really cool place to to be and very interesting because uh it's very hard to get to and so it is a like ecotourism spot as well as a research center and there's just like our team of like eight researchers and then like very wealthy tourists who can afford to get all the way out there um, and we were just like covered in mud and like we would eat with all the employees and have our own like eat time um, and then there'd be like two rich couples that were like just there um but <laughs> anyways it was uh it was really cool to be there uh the river had lots of incredible wildlife there was caimans um which there'll be a picture of at the end um and tons of big fish birds howler monkeys um you name it toucans I got to see so many different things. Um, and there's a window I'm pointing to in the slide down at the bottom. It's a white arrow. And I will show you, there's Kathy and Jack also at the river. But following the arrow, this is that window that I'm pointing to just to show you our little workstation on the inside here that we would spend uh, many late hours just doing just fungal description after description because uh, it was just too hard. You don't, you can't do it in the field. You got to just collect as much as you can, get it back, eat, and then just spend the rest of the day measuring stuff trying to color coordinate we had this color chart here that we we're trying to give uh, um, codes to and dry everything using silica beads so we didn't have dehydrators and we didn't have microscopes but we had tupperware and silica and so you had to keep checking on your mushrooms making sure that they dried properly depending on how wet and dense they were um yeah, and it was a very new process to us. And that window, the reason I'm pointing at it is because <laughs> there were tons of creatures that loved to come in and out from the window. And we thought that it was not closable, but it turns out it was. Um, and there would just be bats flying over our heads like all night long. And you have to like, they are, they're not going to hit you, but you think they're going to hit you. So you're, I would dodge a lot. Um, tons of frogs and geckos. Geckos would just fall from the ceiling, like onto our workstation, because they're just crawling all over the place. And lots of mosquitoes. And um, yeah, it takes a lot of patience. It's it's like glamorous, you know, in in some ways to think of going to do tropical work, but it's also really hard. And here's just kind of a further example of that. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is just kind of how we had to get around in these crazy um, mud covered vehicles just to kind of drive us down this one road and we would just pick a spot that would look good for, you know, whatever given um, task and of what we were trying to collect and we'd hop out, we'd pile like eight or nine of us into that one car Land Rover thing. 
And um, some days we had to cross over lots of flooded um, forest floors, just walk along these logs here. That was Christmas Eve of, of 2021. And we spent the whole day just getting rained on, trying to get to this one site where there was Irish recordings from the 60s on old landing strip along the river. Um, and people fell in the water. Um, there was just a lot of um, a lot of hard times trying to get out there. And then there was no Zyrus. So it uh, just goes to show you have to be really persistent. Um, and we learned a lot in the process. God, I was not allowed to collect that many fungi that day. We had to go really fast. And I had to pass some of the coolest stuff I'd ever seen. Um, but I got some pics. I'll show you some pics. Uh, real quick, after spending a month in Guyana, Jack and I flew over to Trinidad and met up with Luca, who's here tonight. And <laughs> um, we spent 10-ish days there and got to um, see lots of cool stuff. But uh, just as a quick um, geography, so um, Trinidad and Tobago, which Tobago is a big island kind of north uh, east of the bigger island, Trinidad. Um, and it is just seven miles off the coast of Venezuela. So you can see Venezuela, that like gray land mass coming out. So it's super, super close. It drifted off the mainland in more recent geologic history. And actually the, the northern range that you can see there on the, on the map, those mountains are actually the most northern tip of the Andes Mountains that actually wrap around the South American continent. Um, so it's a very interesting um, habitat and a uh, group of diversity that you can see where you have more typical like South American inland fungi, but also Caribbean um, fungi. So that was really, really um, special to see. And here's some pictures just generally, there's that monkey puzzle again. Um, monkey, no, monkey ladder. Uh, yeah, it's a liana, it's a woody vine that um, people were asking about what it was in the picture. Uh, and it's maybe a legume, we weren't 100% sure. But there's Jack and Luca photographing some mimosoid plant. Um, <laughs> and we got to stay at this really beautiful uh, spot called the Coco Palace. And it was basically at the highest point of the island. Um, and it was this very simple it was a former like cocoa pod roasting hut and it's been turned into this like spot that people can rent for a pretty uh, low cost. A lot of researchers go and use it. Um, we were, we got there right as another group was leaving who were studying, um, um, uh, they were setting ocelot traps, uh, camera traps, and trying to document, um, you know, where these cats were. But they're also herpetologists. Um, shout out to the West Indian herpers. We actually had been following them online and hoping to meet up with them. And then we just ran into them here um, after driving on this crazy road that's like you have to like squeeze by each other off cliffs. Um, and yeah, so they lots of they kind of told us about using the space, and so if you are a part of a research group and want to go to Trinidad, let it, let me know. Let us know. We'll connect you because it's a great spot to go and study basically any wildlife. And we um, preemptively contacted at the herbarium of uh, the University of West Indies St. Augustine campus. And it, they house the National Herbarium of Trinidad and Tobago. So the College Herbarium is also the National Herbarium. And you can see this, these pictures uh, of all these people with all these folders. So each of this cabin, these cabinets there is its own plant family. Um, if not one, it might even have multiple, depending on how big the family is. So all, like there's several rows of these uh, big cabinets, and those are all for plants. And then there is a couple of shoe boxes in the bottom corner unlabeled for fungi. Um, and they're not even formally um, ex accessioned into the herbarium. So they're just somebody's project who loved mycology and who got shooed away um, and still has specimens there. Um, and so uh, they do actually, they had a couple of, um, 
of collections that we found in the lichen, also just one corner box, the lichens, um, there were some cyathus. And you can see this collection is from the people, the um, Luca and Matthew are covering it on my screen, but I believe it's 19, is it 47? Something like that, it's from the 40s. Um, and so, so it's just crazy. Uh, so that one nicely made collection was not even, it was under lichens, which it's not a lichen. And so uh, and there weren't many lichens either there. Uh, this doesn't go to say that people have not come to the islands to study uh, fungi since then, but most of the collections made get taken out of the country. Um, and there have since been laws uh, established that kind of put more limitations on this and say that you can't just go into countries and take stuff and then publish it without leaving at least part of your collections. And so we wanted to help um, change, uh, sorry, Buck's coming over here. We wanted to help uh, change this. We contacted them. <laughs> Here's Buck McAdoo, if you know, if you know, uh, my college is studying the clivioids up here. He's just coming to check it out. Um, hi, Buck. Oh, Lucas says hi. Lucas says hi. What? Lucas says hi. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So we, we contacted them. We said, Hey, are you guys willing to take, um, fungal specimens? And they had a new herbarium director who said, uh, yeah, we'll take anything. We need more collections of everything, including all the plants. And, uh, so he was very willing to take these specimens. So we went out, we collected a bunch of stuff and were able to go check out the campus and we submitted how many specimens? 134 between the three of us um and this was between lots of just busy days of running around and we did the best we could and we were able to um give them a more robust collection than they had previously and it was a lot of, we split collections so we brought stuff some stuff back as well but we made sure to leave them um half of that and here's just a quick uh some shots from our trip to the arepo savannas which is uh a protected reserve and you need some permission to to visit and we had we were trying to figure out how we can get that permission and then the people at the college just ended up saying oh we've got botanical permits you can just like let's all go out together so uh they were kind enough to show us this really cool habitat and there's a, a shot of one of our beautiful but beat up hygrosopes it's in the section pseudo um prieta clochlora group just what the names I have for this are. Um, but yeah, there was some overlap to uh, the savannas in Guyana as well. So it was really awesome to have that comparison. And Luca is a prairie nut. And so we were uh, really happy to get out and check out this um, unique and very, very diminished habitat. There were so many more savannas on the, on the island before they've been developed. And uh, here's another cool ha habitat. We got to visit the Karani Swamp and bird sanctuary. And it's not a spot we got to see a lot of fungi at. We were in a boat the whole time uh, in this mangrove, but it's uh, if you're going to Trinidad, definitely check it out. Uh, there were tons of birds. The, there's flamingos that like moved over from Venezuela to, to live there. And there were uh, scarlet ibis as well that, that live there. That are, they're kind of famous for being in this area and were hunted almost to extinction and then protected um, and by the people who run this preserve. And so there was like boa, like little, uh, tree boas and stuff. It's pretty cool. Crabs. And this is, um, Jeffrey Wong song. He's Trinidad Tobago's mushroom man. So whenever you, uh, tell people that you are looking at mushrooms, you're a mycologist, they say, oh, have you met Jeffrey? Every single person we talked to said that. It's every, very tight knit communities on the island. Um, and he runs a small um, but impressive mushroom museum from his home. And so he has all these jars of mushrooms preserved in ethanol. Um, and I mean, when he told us that he had that, I wasn't expecting them to be so well preserved. So here's just some photos so you can see he's had these specimens in here for a really long time. And he's experimented and kind of just found a way that works best. And he's holding a, uh, a phallus, a stink horn. And those were some of the best preserved in ethanol, actually. You can't tell in this photo, but they have that um, really broad 
uh, hold net that comes out. And I was in, amazed at how well it preserved. Um, and he's just really passionate about mushrooms and he kind of, he spends a lot of time, he's a tour guide. And so he gets the public kind of interested in photographing and observing fungi. And so we were really happy to um, connect with him. And he's got a Facebook page if you want to join and check out some of the stuff people find. All right, here's just some of the groups and families of fungi now. So here's the mushroom picks that I promised um, just for the rest of the presentation. What time is it? All right, 8.02. So Xyleraceae, the tropics are a hot spot of diversity for this family. Um, and there's really pretty few species in the Pacific Northwest compared to the tropics. They're just everywhere, growing on all the woody plant, leaf, substrates. Um, they're endophytes and wood decomposers. So they're just on everything really. And um, I was just really excited to see all this variation in morphology. And so you can see some are in the sexual form, some are in the asexual form, some have both. So on the bottom, there's that cool um, kind of branched one and you can see there's asexual growth and then there's the black um, parathesia bumps kind of sectioned off right in the middle there. And the yellow one that I was hoping to see, I don't even remember what it's called, but it's, uh, it's the only yellow one I've seen. And it's also in, um, what would we call it, uh, agriculturally, like, a, yeah, it's an agriculturally important um, fungus as well. So uh, Kathiem and Delon husbands, who I showed you earlier, they actually described the species Xyleria caryoptera, um, and it grows on the seed pods of greenheart, which is a endemic tree it's in the Fabaceae and the bean family to, um, to Guyana and the Guyana shield. It grows a little bit in Brazil and neighboring countries as well. Um, but it has really strong wood that is super resistant to rot. And when the British um, had control of Guyana, they started exporting it. And so it continues to be a big uh, timber export. And so there's funding that goes, you know, into figuring out what could mess with this um, economically. That's what I was looking for. Economically important, um, you know, plant. And so this fungus, you know, has actually had a pretty substantial effect on um, populations of green heart. And it basically it will take a healthy seed. Um, it will it will grow on a seed that could otherwise germinate and basically eat the whole thing and then fruit. Um, so it's lowering the rate of regrowth. They have like pretty, you know, forest, forest deforestation is obviously a problem, but there is actually a lot of smart silviculture practices that do go into the um, logging that is done in Guyana. And that includes like pretty vigorous monitoring of the regrowth of the forests. And so there's just very um, evident uh, decline in growth because of the Silaria. So they described it. That's the first thing you got to do to figure out anything about what's happening with, you know, organisms is make sure that it's uh, has a name to science. And um, when we were down there, we were helping collect more data for Delon's ongoing research of trying to understand more about it, the life cycle, um, different population genetics, et cetera. And here's Luciano, um, one of our guides and his very beautiful collection of Xyleria. And that was like 15 minutes. We said, all right, we're doing a doing a Xyleria haul, everybody. And he went out. He's, I mean, he knows these forests, like this is where he's from, um, he, like just the back of his hand. And so he went out and he came back with his whole tackle boxes full too. Um, and he just brought back all these, look at these bulbous ones. They're crazy looking. So he's uh, really prolific and uh, tuned in man. Okay, and then there were some familiar fungal forms, you know, like I didn't know what to expect. I figured a lot of stuff would look drastically different from what I had known, um, you know, in North America. And here were some of the ones that I like, you know, was like, okay, I've seen this before. Um, the Amanita up top actually uh, was really exciting because it was really uh, one of the few ectomycorrhizal species that we saw. And it was at the top of this like small mountain um, and the only 
there or actually was there cocoloba there was like a few cocoloba trees which are hosts to a lot of ectomycorrhizal but um, they were down lower they weren't near the top and so we were very unsure of what the host was because there weren't any visible ectomycorrhizal um, host trees in that area so we don't exactly know what was going on with this one and it had a really nice smoky um, vulva down there you can see um, peeling off and then a pseudohydnum schizophyllum Callistosporium, auricularia. I'm just spitting off names, but um, yeah, the you know the 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 ear fungus, schizophyllum, which is worldwide. We got cyathus, the bird's nest down at the bottom, and then lots of new and unusual stuff. Um, at least to me, uh, we have what does this get called? Panis, but it's really or it's a panis, but it had I don't know. There, a lot of the names there's like multiple names. Um, but close relative to Panellus stypticus, but it's poured here. Um, I forgot the name for it, but uh, another uh, um, mycorrhizal, this jelly um, tremelagaster. Yeah, wait. Yeah, oh gosh, I'm getting all my names mixed up. But anyways, it's this ectomycorrhizal ball. It looks like a meatball and it's just growing uh, between the roots kind of in the middle of a trail and you cut it open and it's actually... It's in the, is it in the phalales? Gosh, my, my taxonomy is off. Anyways, it has a gleba. It has like a, a spore packet in the inside and a bunch of like squishy jelly balls around it. So that was really interesting. Um, and then there was, yeah, tremelagaster. Gyanagaster is the other one. And then this gooey yellowy thing, that's actually a mucronella. So our mucronella that we know here are kind of the icicle like um, pendulum hanging fruits. And this was a jelly one that we called uh, yellow snot. That was the official, not official, that was the official common name that we were giving it uh, in our documents. Um, and then this bottom one, these pod parachutes coming off of the stick, uh, they were called carapea. Um, but they're they're gymnopus really basically and they're crazy looking they don't look like any gymnopus you know that we see and they're all over the place and I was like freaking out finding them some of these things are like oh my god this is the coolest thing I've ever seen and then it's just kind of everywhere um that includes the kukina the pink cups I'll show you a picture of too a delicatula this non-gilled tiny clear white thing that's in the trichalomatesee and then my first stink horn um down there those kind of rupturing off. And you can see it still has its um, spore mass, the stinky spore mass on the top. And that was the beginning of this hike up to the top of this mountain. And on the way back, it was all gone and it was covered in um, with bees. All right, small and saprobic. Uh, I would say that this was like the majority of, of mushrooms that we saw. Uh, it was a lot of leaf decomposers, kind of woody debris decomposers, seed pod decomposers. Um, we were not in the type of forest that had a lot of mycorrhizal trees, like I said. And so, uh, and also the seasonality combined uh, just led to the general population being tons of small things. And uh, that was totally fine with me and Jack and, uh, and then Luca too in Trinidad is because we love these tiny things. And so, Kathy would apologize and say, sorry, we're not seeing, you know, these like cool, big charismatic stuff. And we're like, don't worry, we got it. <laughs> and um, here's just some examples of that. This is an uh, undescribed Mycena on these leaves here. Super cool uh, looking. And then some tiny uh, kind of flat-headed hygrosides, tons of marasmias all over the place. More marasmias than you can dream of uh, in the tropics. And there's like a seed pod um, still belloid kind of, uh, interesting fruits on that one. All right. Anyone who knows me knows that I love the wax caps. Um, I'm not an expert in wax caps and I'm not an expert in tropical fungi either. So just, so just to kind of clarify that, um, I just, I just really like them a lot. So, uh, here's some that we got to see on the trip, a lot of, you know, bright red, looking ones like not too different than our common conception uh there was a beautiful kufophilus that had this hair that jack found up at the top 
And uh, that was a really beautiful one from one of the Zyra sites. Some pink, what we think are another Kufophilus with the kind of decurrent gills down at the bottom in the super sandy um, habitat. And there was, there was not a lot of macro fungi at all at the Zyra sites, especially out in the ones that had been more disturbed. But every day we went out, we found at least one hygrosity, if not a couple. So that was always a delight. And usually also an entolomataceae. So Chegg, if you know about Chegg, grouping of families that grow together. Um, tiny and alone, this is a tale of tropical hygrosities. So as much as it's fun to find hygrosities and want to document them and give them a good description and get them sequenced, Kathy was very frequently telling us you don't really want singletons. You don't really want a single mushroom um, as much, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, taking some for tissue and then drying it and then having enough. And then we have to leave half of our collections at the University of Guyana. So if you have one mushroom, it, it really, she tried to say, is not worth writing up and saving. But I didn't care and I did it anyways, um, just because I was so excited to find them. So here's what a lot of that looked like. There was me trying to desperately to keep them separate and figure out which one was which and give them names because not only would there just be one, but none of them were described. So none of them had names. So I had to come up with code names for them. And it couldn't be red high grow three. It had to be something that like described a texture on it or something about the habitat. And so that was a struggle to to differentiate them and, and actually document them. And uh, I had to kind of let a few go because of that. Oh, hi, Beef. I see the wiener dog Beef on the screen. Um, there's a really beautiful red one in the moss down there. That was a, that one has actually ended up being a great collection. Um, and here's some of the few robust collections that I made. There was really minimal that had more than like two mushrooms, um, but here's some. And I was really excited about the find on the right that had this really perfectly flat topped cap and really diminished gills. They're almost just like veins at this point. And it's like, I don't know how much of the stuff I can say, but there, there are wax caps, there are hygrosities. Well, we do, no, no, there's one described from Ecuador um, that has no gills and has just a cap and a smooth hymenium. Um, and there are some that can even have almost no gills and be more kind of club-like. And so this one, it's like questionable of, is this an intermediary state? I don't know, but it's definitely got unique morphology and that they're super small, um, just like maybe two inches. All right, there's that white sand. You can see so much was growing in the white sand. Here's just some of the really... Diverse hygrosity conica group. Um, it's just a large, large cosmopolitan species group that has tons of diversity. A lot of them need description. And so when you found uh, some, I talked to the expert, Jean Lodge, um, Dr. Jean Lodge, um, before going on this trip. And I said, what should I look out for? And she said, definitely know any of the conicas and give them some really good like field notes, including um, if they have the hairs on the top that are up, raised up or flat. Um, and if you cut it and if there's clear liquid that oozes out and if it oozes out, how quickly does it ooze out? And all these really interesting um, minutia that were difficult to document because we'd be carrying things in our tackle box all day. And then I get home and if you know this group at all, most of the time you open it up and they're just black. And it was pretty hard to get uh, some of those descriptive details down, but I did get some back in time. You can see them like blackening as I'm going, um, but you can see some of the white gills on the one on the top here. Um, and they were so small, like we're used to the ones out here being pretty big, but you can see the crease of my finger um, just in the upper uh, top there, how small some of these young uh, fruits were. They were mega tiny. All right, Antelomataceae. Like I said, they were also pretty common at the Zyrus sites. Um, you know, on days where we didn't find many mushrooms, there'd be a couple of entos and a couple of high grows. Um, lots of cool lichens on the like shrubby plants. But 
Uh, here's some of the few that we did find. Um, a lot of them are in the genus Inocephalus, which I learned on the East Coast when I was learning mushrooms, and we don't have as many out here. Um, things get shuffled around a lot in Entolomataceae between Entoloma and other groups, offshoot genera. But um, the Inocephalus are known for having kind of a, they're the unicorn Entolomas, so the uh, usually have some kind of point on the top of the cap. And I thought this bottom one was really cute. It looks kind of like a Mycena, but it's a, um, in this pink gill family and has this cute little uh, pointy hat. And this orange one too, which was a stumper because at first I was like, ooh, hygrosity. And I was like, oh no, maybe it's a Mycena, but it's got pink spores and is uh, another undescribed anocephalus. And the blue one was the only blue, I think the only blue mushroom besides the blue crust that I saw, but uh, I had seen some pictures of these bigger blue mushrooms and I was hoping to just see any of one of the big blue mushrooms because I like blue mushrooms. And on that day of Christmas Eve where we were hiking for miles and miles and it was pouring and everything was going wrong, I just looked down at my feet and this one caloderma, this blue one here was just right there. And so that was exciting. That was a nice treat when things weren't um, exactly going as planned. And it was pretty big too. It was like, I don't know, like five, six inches. So bigger than most things we saw. Most things were like just a couple inches or less. Okay, Mycenaceae, another really, really common family of saprobes just everywhere, including here, you know, um, especially in the tropics along with the marasmius. Uh, and they'll grow on tons of stuff too, on the palm tissues, on the wood, on the leaves. Uh, there's this section Amparina that was pretty abundant, really tiny and fragile. They're the bottom um, white powdery ones. And they just like, that's one of their charismatic uh, characteristics is that they have these flecks and, and that will kind of, as the cap opens up, get spread across the cap. And there's like a lime green one that's so much of this was undescribed. So it was like keeping track of it all was difficult, but there was one with green and Kathy said, look out for the green one. And I found my first green one and she's like walking barefoot covered in mud. And I go, look, look, I've got the green one. And as I'm holding the leaf in my hand with one of the little green mushrooms, a raindrop came and splashed the leaf and just the mushroom was just gone. And then I ended up finding more um, later on, but that was just kind of funny. And favalasha, which are poured, so convergent evolution of, of having pores as your fertile surface, you know, um, same with gills, same with spines, it, you know, doesn't mean they're all related. So in the family of mycenas, we've got this teeny, 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 tiny, like mil couple millimeters, maybe long, uh, tiny little uh, things that are, you know, close related to their guild cousins that are more familiar to us. And that was on some palm, like, not bark, but a palm leaf petiole or something, uh, the white ones up there. And they were like, God, they were just so small. They were like a millimeter or something. It was very hard to photograph them. And there were some red ones and all different kinds of cool ones. So um, these intervenous pink, uh, my, my senos, I forgot what, what uh, section they're in or whatnot, but I found some collared ones that had these tiny little spikes on them. That was cool. And then the red, the undescribed red, really abundant leaf um, consuming species. And then the marasmaceae, which I mentioned several times being really abundant, but gosh, I'd say probably more than anything, there was just tons of xylarias, tons of marasmioids. And uh, I really liked this family. So it was really nice to see them. I didn't get really bothered by them much, but you were only really able to collect so many. And there's like some pleurotoid ones, like um, Cadio colathus, Cadio marasmius, these ones with the uh, hairs down at the bottom. Um, and then one I want to point out, there's, well, there's Tetrapyrgos too, and the white knobby things, this photo on the, on the top here, it is Bruneo corticium. It is only described in its this asexual form, and it makes these. It consumes leaf petioles, so like the stem of the leaf, kind of the center part, and it'll just like eat massive swaths of it and make these like interesting white mycelial asexual 
think they're conidial too, uh, growths that make these knobs. And then birds collect them and actually take them up to their nests and um, will weave them into their, their nesting material. And that's true of other marasmoids as well, even ones that do fruit um, sexually. And so you'll see these long rhizomorphs, you'll see maybe this wiry stuff that's just kind of growing, and maybe there'll be some mushrooms on it, maybe not. But that stuff is even, I think, more structurally durable for this nesting material. And those mushrooms really, most of the time, will only even fruit once they're brought up to the top of the tree canopy. So they're super ecologically important, really interesting. And the AIM lab has done a lot to describe these mushrooms and record their ecological um, role and importance. Okay, not too far off from being done with these groups here. Here's some ascomycetes, uh, just kind of a crowd fave. A lot of us like the ascomycetes. If, you, if you're getting into your, um, not later years, but past your earlier years of mushrooming, I feel like you just naturally start gravitating towards cup fungi because they're uh, they'll be around, you know, in other times where we don't see guild mushrooms, in places we don't see them, and they're just really abundant and present if you look more closely. So that includes in the tropics. And you can just kind of see a general assortment here. There are some earth tongues in the upper corner that were really thick and clustered in Trinidad. That was a fun find. Um, and then Kukina, these are two different species of Kukina, the pink cups down here. And I had seen pictures from the tropics of these cups for years, and I, I just couldn't wait to see them. And I freaked out when I saw them for the first time. If you've ever been with me, when I find any cool mushroom, but especially like one I hadn't seen before, I like, I'll spend forever sitting there with it. And I had to just get used to it pretty fast because Kukina, if you go anywhere in the tropics, neotropics, you're going to see Kukina all over. They're just very commonplace mushroom and but they're gorgeous and there's tons of insects and other animals that will interact with them there's pictures of poison dart frogs just kind of like chilling in them when they fill with water and that's one you know you see people put frogs on mushrooms but these are like legit like these frogs you know I hope people aren't picking up these poison frogs and maybe they do sometimes but anyways I love frogs I love to see them hanging on cups so I advise you to um, google Kukina poison dart frog. And we also have uh, this orange kind of flowery thing in the middle. They call it the orange bladder. It's Glaziella or Antioca, and it's a, an interesting kind of ground dwelling um, ascomycete. And it's pretty big too, and it just kind of hangs out in the like leafy, woody material. And it has this internal chamber compartment that is very unusual. And then that's really it, you know, just we saw lots of cups and they're awesome. That's that. Polypores. Uh, yeah, here's some polypores. Uh, there's, there's tons of them. Tons of Ganodermas, tons of Favolus, which I thought, I assumed Favolus and Favolus were related, but they're not. And Favolus are bigger, they're fleshier, they've got this kind of more geometric pore shape, and they're just a, a stunner to find. They're the up, the most top um, left one, the white one there. And lots of this uh, Tremedes, these bright orange uh, poured Tremedes, and oh, Lent Lentinus. Lentinus, which are gilled, and uh, just cool that they're in the poured mushroom uh, lineage. Those are all over the place and just kind of common to find even in like cities and um, more pop populated areas just on decaying wood. Really thick and dense. You can tell that they're polypore relatives. And then something that was cool was this, uh, well, there's stalked polypores too. So upper right, you can see there's just stalked polypore. These are these are Ganodermas and uh, Maradermas that will just hold themselves up with a full kind of fruit rosette at the top or just a single plate. And below that, there's what looks like a Xylaria. And I at first I found some, I go, oh, these are really long. They're just super, they're like several feet long. 
and we just I guess as soon I wrote that it was Xyleria down there like no no it's actually it's a Ganoderma gyanensis oh polyporous gyanensis excuse me um and it's this asexual form of this polypore that's just really wiry and just kind of grows all over the place just like in the debris um and very infrequently it makes a really cute tiny little fruit um that's like just like like maybe an inch or two wide um on these elongated type structures um but it spends most of its like time out and about in this asexual form which i didn't know was a thing and so oh that's the fruit actually um i didn't even realize in the under where it says polypores that's what the fruit is it yeah sorry i made these slides like a year ago so i'm like what's what it looks just like that if it's not thanks for bearing with me here guys <laughs> Um, here's the clubs and corals. You know, there was not too many of these, but there were quite a few. I didn't see this blue one in the middle, but I really wanted to. I kind of scouted on INAT um, beforehand. And this was our friend Kaima, who uh, is part of the West Indian uh, herpers. So go check them out on Instagram. And she found this really, really cool blue coral. And I hope to see that one one day. And then just saw kind of other pretty normal looking ones. Um, this bottom one here may or may not be in the hygrophoraceae. I'll just say that it is a full on club and it's super uh, epic and it's undescribed. So we'll see what, what happens there. And then the entomopathogens. So hypocraolins, everyone really likes these for the most part, um, unless you don't like bugs. It, so this is very bug heavy, the next two slides, like three or four of them. So if you don't like bugs, go get a drink of water. Um, I advise you to just watch anyways and get over it because if you like mushrooms, you'll want to see some cordyceps and stuff. Uh, there's a big old ant <laughs> with a... Uh, some uh, fungal growth coming out of it. So these are all fungi that are uh, using insects as a host, be it like an adult ant or insect um, or a larva of some sort. And um, the center picture, this was or originally just called like an Isaria tenuopes, but it's a um, cordyceps tenuopes now, I think. And it's kind of this isterioid growth is this kind of fluffy conidial, um, growth of the entomopaths and it's something you can see across different um, species as well and it's just like so this was a buried uh that white grub thing it's kind of encased in like mycelium and that was buried below the leaf it was kind of in a leaf cocoon that the larva had made and then the fungus kind of crept in there consumed the larva and then fruits out from underneath the, the leaf litter. So you only see the uh, fluffy, I called them yellow flowers, just as like the general um, name when I was taking notes, because it looked just like some of the stamens and flower inflorescences that had been dropping from the trees all around it. So it was really interesting. And I saw, excuse me, I saw this one on that crazy hike on Christmas Eve. And I I almost walked past it because I picked up too many flowers that were not fungi. And then I stopped and I, and I excavated this one just in case. And I found the larva and I was super excited. Um, then we saw a couple more as well. And then there's an Ophiocordyceps on a cricket, this pink one. I think Amazonensis is that one. And then there's these Hypocrellas, these orange leaf. They grow on the scale insects. So underneath the leaf, this orangey, um, fungus will kind of consume these scale insects and make little rooting structures, I think, on the perimeter, these like pods. So that was great. And here's some more. These are from Trinidad. These are all from, these were from Guyana. And then these are from Trinidad. And they, this was all a night walk that we went looking for um, reptiles and amphibians with the West Indian herpers who were so kind to take us out in the south part of the island. And they all, they're they just super skilled at, at, they don't even really have to find them. They just see them all over the place as they're looking at like plant material. They find these entomopathogens just on like attached to the leaves, underneath the leaf, on the tops of the leaves, on the ground. 
because they're looking for snakes and stuff and, and frogs. And so here's just a cool diversity all from a, like an hour of being out. There's just so much um, to look at and tons of different hosts. We even have a hyperparasite on the bottom, which Connor and Richard, we were like FaceTiming them from, <laughs> from like a 10 year old's bedroom. We had all these crazy uh, insects with like these, you know, um insane looking fungi coming out of them just like on our home base was this 10 year old's bedroom that we should bring all these crazy giant giant fungus spiders into and she wasn't she wasn't staying in the bedroom but it was just pretty funny to um to to do that and so we were like facetiming and connor's like you know what it looks like there's a a, a, a hyper parasite like there's a fungus on the fungus that's on the insect and so that kind of blew our minds. We tried to culture it um, and a bunch of other things as well. And I don't know if we end up figuring out what it is, but that's just a really interesting ecology there, kind of piggybacking on, you know, fungus on a fungus on an insect on a leaf situation. And then uh, the giant spider on the bottom, that was a huntsman. And it was huge. It was like the size of a little cookie plate or something. And apparently they're just everywhere and they just get uh, eaten by the fungus and they'll be more susceptible after they molt. They'll kind of have like a softer uh, exoskeleton and the fungus will just kind of take advantage of that. And we shined a UV light on and got to see some cool positive reaction. And you can see the fungus behind like the eyes of the spider and in the joints um, particular. And so this is all like asexual conidial uh, growth. Um, yeah, this Terubiella or Jabalula, old, old name, new name. And then here's just some cool insects that have not been eaten by a fungus yet. Uh, cool moth with leg warmers up top. Um, got some like leaf hoppers and grasshoppers. Uh, just tons of moths. Uh, my favorite kinds of naturalists are ones who just want to go look at anything. And so our, our herpetology friends were just like looking at insects, looking at frogs, looking at fungus. Um, and they got to show us some really cool tarantulas and uh, that ones that had parastoid wasps, kind of having a larva of this wasp just like eat the tarantula alive. Um, and then a, a healthy, tiny dwarf tiger tarantula that stays very small and has a pink heart on its abdomen got to hold that and that was cool and uh the orb weavers with the spines that's up top the yellow and black jumping spider on the bottom it's my very uh all over the place curation okay leaf cutter ants leaf cutter ants are um a really really fascinating symbiosis that is very ancient. It's a co-evolution that took over 30 million years to complete, and it involves several um, participants. But first, I will just show you what it looks like to stumble upon some on a trail. You're just kind of walking, and then you see, let's see, you can watch this video up top. These cute ants, they're pretty big. They've got these big mandibles for grabbing and chewing up these leaves, and they just are walking together kind of like in a line. And you you kind of just have to be mindful not to disturb them because um, they really, they're on a mission and it's very clear. I didn't exactly know. I knew there was fungus involved, but I didn't know how it worked. And I've just been blown away reading more. You can see them just kind of in their path here, picking out some vegetation, chewing it up and bringing it home to their colony. And that's what the entrance looks like at the bottom, this brown kind of raised tunnel. They have really intricate tunnel systems that they'll build underground. Um, and they uh, rely on fungus to feed their babies. And so they will go out, all these worker ants will go and they'll chew up vegetation, kind of clip it, take it home, chew it up and, and spit it out and give it to this mycelium basically that stays in in a non-fruiting state it's so it's actually this this co-evolution has led to this system where these these fungi that are involved do not produce fruiting bodies and instead they actually produce kind of a swollen hyphal tip called a gunglidia and the ants will actually feed that to the developing um larva 
And uh, all of the fungi that are in the symbiosis are actually on the agaricaceae. So like the, you know, the button mushrooms and the prince and stuff, they're all in that, in that family. They're all close relatives, but none of them fruit. And the most commonly known one, if you're curious, is called Leuco agaricus gongliferus, named after that um, specialized structure. And so there's also involved in the symbiosis, there's a bacteria that lives on the backs of the ants that actually produces antibiotics um, that will fend off a mycoparasite. So another fungus that wants to eat the fungus that is um, feeding their young. And so that's kind of a non as well-known partner that's involved. And um, let's see, there's a picture here showing you the bacteria on the ant, this kind of ant colony structure. There's the crop pest fungus down at the bottom. And if, if it's not like well controlled, it can actually uh, wipe out the whole colony. And so the ants will clean themselves and kind of remove spores off of their body pretty regularly to prevent it from taking um, hold. And they'll also um, remove like infected if they see pieces of the colony or other individuals that are infected they'll like remove them from um, the rest and uh, the the ants will actually learn what plants the fungus wants to eat so if they bring back a plant that's maybe like high in some compound that irritates the fungus they'll actually be able to the the fungus will put out some type of chemical response that the ants can then pick up on and then after that they will not bring that plant back to the fungus again so it's this really interesting communicative system um i'm just mind blown by it and uh yeah so here's just a couple of uh i didn't i didn't get to see you know i don't get to see the whole inner workings of the of the leaf cutter colony but you see them everywhere uh, you also see other kinds of insect fungal interactions as well. Um, and this is a termite nest up top. And there is a tiny little um, pleurotoid, maybe a crepidotus or clitopilus. I don't know if we figured out which one. I tried to get a spore print. But anyways, it's growing on the old abandoned termite mounds. And so that was very um, cool to see. And then there's also, what is it, terula? I think on the bottom growing as well on um, some like discarded colony material. Um, and that's these like club like branched things. And then on the right, there's some dust lichens growing as well on some um, old termite or ant uh, housing, which is cool. And then crusts, just throw, you know, a couple crusts. I put it in quotes because like the definition of crust fungi kind of varies depending on um, who you're talking to. But like smooth hymenium, smooth fertile surfaces, I think what's technically a crust, but people will call resupinate things that are growing flat on a substrate, including polypores crust sometimes. And these are just some some nice colors. I got to see some kind of bright indigo purple, um, purpley crusts. In, uh, just kind of scattered around and then there was tons of this yellow um yellow one that the ants were actually pretty protective over um and if you touched it too much they they would bite you um so <laughs> i call it the mustard crust but uh, i think jack knows more about what's going on there and then i think that's a tricaptum or something this purpley pink one it did bracket so it's very pretty and then that's the end of the fungal main fungal part. Here's some lichens that were really cool. Uh, they really love to grow on the palm leaves because palms are just really everywhere in the tropics and it's a good flat open substrate for them. So mosses and lichens will just take root and you'll get these cool mosaics kind of just out on the leaves. And then uh, this one in the center here was my favorite. It, I don't know what it is, but it's a lorelate lichen. So this type of sexual structure, uh, that's a, a, it's producing fungal spores, um, sexual spores, and they're like the script lichen. So if you've ever seen graphis, graphis scripta, or any in the graphidaceae, uh, it's these kind of elongated fruiting bodies. And this was like the craziest color that uh, I'd ever seen of that. And then uh, Cenogonium are common lichens that look like they're bryophytes, but they're actually uh, lichen eyes. And that's this upper right top shelf, green shelf situation. And they're uh, 
I think they'll serve as a biont for other lichens as well. There's a, a jelly lichen with some pink fruits. There's a basidio lichen down at the bottom, maybe um, multiclavula or something. And that was that was fun to see. Some more jelly lichen. I kind of shone the light through in the middle. You see the, the photo of the black lichen with the veins. That that's um, one of my favorite types of lichen to see. And so those have a cyanobacteria as their symbiotic photosynthesizing partner versus a green algae, and um, which is a lesser common pairing. And then some crusts, some pink crusts with a nice gray uh, apothecia on the bottom with and a nice dark, <laughs> I'm like calling everything now, I'm like, it's nice, it's cool, <laughs> a dark uh, perimeter on the edge there. Myxomycetes, uh, slimes, actually are, I don't even know if Ceridia mixa fit into technically myxomycete, but uh, the only thing that we saw and identified as a slime mold were Ceridia mixa species, but there was some cool morphology in the different species. And so here's uh, a couple of them. The one on the left is like more of what we're used to seeing, kind of the Fruticulosa growth form but there were like honeycombed ones and pom-pom ones. And that was a delight. There are so many small like favalashes and things that it was hard to tell like before you walked up to it, what it was gonna be. Was it gonna be slime or some tiny mushroom related? Here's some plants. There's a mycoheterotrophic plant, the yellow one, the first one, Voria. Um, that's, you know, so it's feeding off its it's getting its sugars from a fungus that's mycorrhizal with a, um, a plant. And that's cool to see a tropical one like that. There's some, um, what are these called? Oh, Ripsalis, these cool uh, epiphytic cacti that were all over the place, and, and including in the cities, which made really beautiful uh, urban, natural, you know, landscapage. Some fern sori. So underneath the fern, you can see all these spores arranged in this like absolutely stunning pattern on the in the right. There's a, a cashew down at the bottom. I'm kind of holding the tip of the cashew uh, nut fruit at the bottom. Um, people eat the fruits. They say the juice is good, but there's some toxicity involved. Um, some flowers just coming right out of the bark of the trees. That blew my mind. And um, yeah, there was a lot of really good plants. And some animals, tons of frogs, tons of cane toads, lots of caimans as well in the river. Um, I fed, this was like the local feral um, caiman and uh, the people at the research center just kind of hand you chicken and are like, go give her chicken. And so I fed her chicken on Christmas day. Um, and uh, there's a jaguar print all the way up in the corner, this cool marsupial possum tropical possum that we caught we didn't catch it but we visually caught it and probably startled it by shining a bright light but we didn't get to see too many mammals so that was cool and uh, he had a long long tail it actually spooked me in the night it was kind of like we were like following each other on accident um and then jack was able to get a good picture really cute snakes um that was a baby snake i don't remember what kind but common um, Trinidadian snake. And then these insects that had this, like they were like migrating up the tree with this long white fluff. And that was pretty unusual. The natives who were from that area said that they had only seen it once before. Um, and they can be found throughout South America um, in Peru and other places. I don't remember what they're called, but yeah, the frogs are, that's the male hugging onto the female and she just jumps around and he's just doing his thing. Uh, lots of moths and mosquitoes. You got to be okay with being eaten alive by mosquitoes. There's no way to get around it, really. Um, chiggers are also, they'll get you. So lots of, um, lots of animals. We love them. Okay. Okay. I'm doing great on time. Just about done. Uh, if anybody wants, wow, there's 49 chat things. Um, but if anybody wants to, um, answer this question, feel free. There's going to be three questions. How many kingdoms of life are involved in leaf cutter and symbioses? 
Dan's holding fingers up. I can only see you, Dan. <laughs> what do you got? What are you saying? Are you saying three or four? Is this three? Let's see. I don't know. I couldn't tell, but it's four. <laughs> we got the plants. We got the ants. <laughs> we got the bacteria and we got the fungi. So there's four different kingdoms of life involved in this um, in the symbiosis, which is crazy yeah. to think about. Yeah. I forgot the bacteria. Yeah. And they're like, they're, yeah, they're considered to be a part of the symbiosis because they're help, like they're helping these ants uh, fend off this fungus that wants to eat their fungus. Okay. What structure does the fungus is Fusarium xyrophyllum, that's supposed to be italicized, create on xyrus plants? This is an easy one. Somebody say it. So I heard it. Pseudoflower. Yep, it's a pseudoflower. Yeah. Woohoo. Last one. Lichens in the tropics are commonly found growing on trees. Yes, trees. It's true. There's a there's a more specific answer I'm looking for here. It's not there's not like a number like this is the most common thing, but I just mentioned that being a substrate they like. Leaves. Leaves, what kind of leaves? I said so much, so I'm not judging any of you. Palm. People are saying palm in the chat. Palm, palm, <laughs> yeah, palm leaves. Oh, palm leaves. yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm done now. Here's the resources. Uh, yeah, re any research by Dr. Catherine Aim. Uh, she's M. Catherine Aim, or is Mary Catherine Aim. Uh, so she's got just so much literature on all different kinds of topics within mycology. So even if you're not exactly interested in the tropic stuff, please do uh, search her up, read about her work. She's really such a important mycologist of our time. And uh, yeah, her work is astounding. And she's a great person who um, creates opportunity for all different kinds of people. So check her out. Um, Terry Hankel, also at Humboldt, has done a lot of work with Kathy and uh, continues to go down to the tropics. We actually met him and Noah Siegel down there and, and their team too, Sarah also, who was with them. And we traded off like the, the brothers, the, the guides who we were with, who have worked with both of them a lot, were with us for the month. And then they switched over to uh, the other research teams because we were coming and going at different times in Georgetown. Um, but anyway, so yeah, um, there's more people. Biddy Roy and Vru Vandegrift and Danny Newman have all done work in um, Ecuador and other countries, um, Bolivia, et cetera. Noah has got some great photos and his last time down in Guyana. And he's also been to Cameroon. Check out tropicalfungi.org. Uh, like I showed you earlier, there's the AIM Lab website. If you just type in um, AIM Lab onto Google or um, Catherine Aim, she'll come up. And then there's the Irokrama River Lodge and Mushrooms of Trinidad and Tobago Facebook page. There's also one for Puerto Rico. So that's, you know, Caribbean tropical fungi as well. If you are wanting to just be involved in some kind of, you know, online community based uh, place, then there that's somewhere you can go. And yeah, thanks for being here today, everyone. There's my email and my iNaturalist and my Instagram. And so I don't have all of my observations up for this trip on iNaturalist, but I do have some. And so feel free to follow me. You'll see them eventually. And you'll see the other stuff that I put up um, in um, my time. Eileen asked if you would recommend ethanol for preserving fungi. Well, I haven't done it, really. I tried putting some mushrooms in isopropyl because uh, it was what I had. I only have like tiny bottles of ethanol for like microscopy and stuff. I don't have um, like she has you have to order like buckets of it. And um, so I would recommend trying it. Definitely. I think it's going to be hit or miss. You're going to you're going to end up finding the mushrooms like you have to be willing to have a bunch of jars and a bunch of alcohol and a bunch of mushrooms that may end up getting really weird in those jars in order to try it. But 
if you're able to get your hands on a lot of ethanol, I'd say have fun and report back. Let us know what West Coast fungi or wherever you are fungi hold well. Because he had one that like he wanted to keep that was like, was it the macroscopy? Microscopy? Microscopy? Uh, yeah, what? it was really big macroscopy t- titans. Was, yeah, it was, like it was two it feet was across. Not. It was in a 10 gallon fish tank. Um, but it needed to go in the garbage because yeah. it was not preserving well, but he was just it was floating it. to the top of the ethanol. <laughs> it was um, gross. It wasn't ideal, I would say. But yeah, I bet there's stuff that will preserve well. So um, go for it. Yeah, a big mushroom. It would take a long time for the ethanol to displace the water inside. But... Yeah, don't go for big, don't go for big watery mushrooms. Yeah. Go for like xeromphalina and like things that are denser and have less water in it, you know? Yeah, yeah I know one of our club ministers uh, after a NAMA for a uh, uh, came back with a vodka bottle full of chanterelles. There you go. Definitely don't, don't like was... consume the mushrooms that you preserve for educational purposes. Yeah, these I don't think were for educational purposes. <laughs> there was one other question. Let's see, David Kurtz asked, uh, "How do they know it's a Luca agaricus if it never fruits?" Referring to the little fungi oh, in the ant colony. Definitely and, sequencing. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe there's, I don't, I haven't looked at the paper describing, um, Luca agaricus gongliferus. So that would be a good thing to do for all of us to learn more. But, uh, if there's probably like, I, yeah, I don't see how they would have known at all that it was <laughs> in, uh, agaricaceae or that it was like even related if they didn't do sequencing on them, because there's no features that relate it really to like, maybe there's some hyphal structures that are similar, but I I'd bet my my money that it was um they took some tissue and they ran some primers and they got a sequence back and they plugged it into the glo- some global database and got tons of stuff in agaricaceae you know okay i'm seeing now the chat feel free to like say a question i'm going to be looking just in the chat here but um if you have a question feel free to unmute well, where I started, hey, um, I'm John. I spent Hi. a couple of weeks down there in Guyana um, for an oil company working in the old um, sugarcane fields. So it was completely, you know, irrigated and developed. They did have a um, primitive area. I'm just wondering what is the future of that? And what is the future of their agriculture? And what is the future of, and this may be outstepping your, what you're covering for sure, but what is the future of uh, the, that, that coast there? The coast? Yeah. The coast is, has a unfortunate fate, I think. I mean, so they, this whole town of Georgetown, I'm sure you were in Georgetown, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, based you, saw of, the, yeah. you saw the seawall, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you're like the town of Georgetown is actually like eight feet below sea level. Um, And so they have a seawall that keeps the tides from flooding Um, and it has flooded. So so that whole area naturally was mangrove habitat. And they relied not, you know, what mangroves do is they have these raised up roots that trap sediment and create these um, kind of barriers to the, from the inland. And obviously tons of organisms will live there. And that's like a really unique place, but, uh, and that also kept Guyana specifically from being colonized as quickly as other areas along the shore of South America, along the coast, um, because it was such a difficult terrain for um, the imperialists to cut through to get into that it was like left for like, okay, we people have to come back here and people kept coming back until it was finally able to like be destroyed essentially. But um, I don't know what the future is. Uh, there's a really heavy oil rigging. Did you say you were, it was through an oil? Leave, rig? right? Yep. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I work through geology and it's um, basically Guyana is uh, running off diesel 
now to to run any electricity. And so they made a deal with, with an oil company to build LNG plants on land. And that's why I was there. Um, okay. And this, I don't, I don't want to make this a tangent at all, but. Um, oh, no, it's important. Yeah. But uh, so like building facilities and like re like turning these old sugarcane fields into something new is what they're doing. And it's a lot of flat land that's um, heavily, uh, like I said, has um, irrigation through it nonstop. And then there is the, the quote unquote wild lands that start to the, the west and the south. And the, oh, I, I love when you brought up the white sands. It's like, yeah, that's where the white sands come from. <laughs> um, that's yeah. where things get, get, start getting really interesting. But still all that, you know, it could come back to some stasis. Um, I know it'll be an LNG plant, whatever, but I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just saying something rather than asking a question. No, I mean, it's good for people to also to get some context because I didn't really go into the natural history or the modern development situation there. Um, and I don't know yeah, much about like restoring sugarcane fields specifically. I imagine that like if it was cut down, that there'd be some natural regrowth of some of the um, organisms that like that sandy, more coastal habitat. But it's still there's going to be invasives. And if it's not yeah. cared for, then it might just end up being a weedy, you know, plot. So I'm... Yeah. I'm unsure. I, I got to see more of what is going on and hear more of the uh, kind of projected plans for the forest, more specifically when I was at Irokrama, because they are funded by the Commonwealth of Britain. And um, a lot of that money goes into trying to come up with like sustainable practices for silviculture and for like lumber harvesting. And so it's, the, you know, it sounds kind of bad but it's actually done pretty responsibly it, it wish it didn't have to be done at all um, yeah, exactly. the best but it's do. it's funding the conservation too so there's a part of the preserve that we looked at the map and there's like a big chunk of it that is untouchable no foresting you know forestry will happen in this chunk and then on the other side there's plots that will get they'll go in and they'll take certain trees so they're not going in and wiping out entire swaths of forest it's like there's plottage all the trees are plotted and then they pick they come up with some equation where they figure out how many trees to take from any given plot and so it's really highly monitored and it's considered to be some of the best in the world in terms of like sustainable forestry practices but um I some, yeah i had some really good experiences with people in the governmental um ecology. yeah one more thing on that topic, too, is that the Guyanese government is super unstable and there's a lot of shifting of hands of political power. And so every time that Kathy goes down, she has to redo tons of paperwork and the laws and the limitations on her permits are different. And uh, like this time we went more specifically was stricter than other times. And we had to go through more hoops to be able to get stuff. And a lot of stuff had to be left in the country. And we're going to she's going to have people bring back in the future. But it kind of stifled some of the research at the end of being able to take data and specimens home. Um, and that also ties into how the land is preserved. And so I know that the current administration, if it's even still the same as it was last year, because apparently every few years it's different, um, it, uh, they're selling out parcels of land that like were otherwise intact to oil and lumber companies. Yes. Yes. So yeah. the future is uncertain and it's unstable, I'd say. But there's some hope. At least there's some preserves. But even preserves, as we see in other um, parts of the world, like the the work in Los Cedros in Ecuador uh, that Rue and Danny and some others have and Biddy have all been involved in. It's like that's supposed to be like this area safe from mining. And yet still it is being impeded on and Native people are being you know, stripped away from the little bit that they have left in these regions. So it's, as in, uh, as in yeah. I, I don't, I don't follow the gold trip in Guyana too much, but there's that too, but yeah, I'll, I'll, it's, it's I'll, dense topic. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. If anyone wants to talk more about that, I still have a lot more to educate myself Back on. Mushrooms. Yeah. Well, I, will, I will, will say one more thing on that is that 
when John was down there, I was getting really interested in it. And so two things, an article came up in The Economist talking about how Guyana had the largest GDP growth out of any country in the world. And I think it's all related to the potential for LNG plants and a lot of people getting jobs out of that. So that was like one interesting slash horrifying side of it. Um, and the other thing was talking about why it hasn't been developed yet. And you kind of talked about like how muddy the roads were. <laughs> There's essentially no infrastructure to get into the interior. And so it is um, kept in its primitive state because the government hasn't pumped money into into making it anything else. But yeah, I, I do worry that with all of this injection of money that um, they're going to see that happen. And then of course, you know, on the other side, we've got, um, on the coastal side, we've got the LNG plants and the um, probably further development of the coastline, which will take out mangroves. And then the fact that the seawall is really the only thing that is keeping Georgetown um, a, yeah. a livable place. People so. are living in severe poverty in that city. Like that's where most of the people live in this in that country. And it's, it's pretty, it's it's difficult to see like there's people who are clearly that they, they live in in shacks and but then there's some modernized parts of the city and so a lot of that money comes in through oil too into their economy and then goes right back out too it like they don't get to keep a lot of the money that that gets uh de, you know from these developments off the shore and stuff and it's the same in trinidad too it's like their whole look and their family was telling us about how the economy was thriving and all these businesses opened up because all this oil money was coming in and then they ran out of oil off the shores there and let all the oil companies packed out and there's just these like dead rigs and stuff and it's like it's like dipped their economy but uh tying up that note it's really thanks for sharing guys um and it's it is hard to 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 talk about and we don't know what to do you know and they're you know we'll have to just stay educated and talk to people and do, you know, try to observe diversity if we can and hope that makes a difference somewhere along the line. That's how I, you know, that's what I'm doing. And, but it was a privilege to be able to go there. And um, like I said, I wasn't a grad student in the AIM lab, but she was just kind enough to take us. And um, we proved our potential to her. Uh, she was proud of us. So that felt good. Um, uh, Jonathan, hi, you've done tropical work. How did we, um, dry our silica beads. Uh, we uh, had people bake them in the oven um, or on the, no, they cooked them on the, the pot. Um, we were at the, specifically at the uh, research lodge and there was kitchen access there. But a lot of times when Kathy goes, they go into a remote camp where they're, they airplane in and have no facilities at all in those situ and they like live in hammocks and stuff. I'm sure you did some similar work um, and so we didn't do that because of limitations from the coronavirus. We couldn't go into the Kyatra Falls area of um, the interior. And so we stayed at the at the lodge. And uh, I think they fire dry, redry the silica there. They, they do it over fire. I'm pretty sure. Um, or they bring so much that they don't have that much. So they can't bring enough for all the mushrooms. They must be doing it over over a fire. I'm pretty sure that's what they said. And uh, Kendra, thanks for, yeah, no, what is it? No, not Nothopanis. Nothopanis is the other thing. But you somewhere in here, you mentioned the name of the uh, Neopanellus and, and stuff. Um, yeah, you guys talking about the mushrooms and the alcohol stinkhorn cocktail. Mm, Connor, go for it. I did drink beer out of a, a Sarasvera, Sarkasvera cup, <laughs> so we can, we can get creative. Um, Neo Nothopanis, geez, all these names. I, I do admit I'm getting uh, falling behind in my taxonomy brain, but there is so much to know. But just get to relearn things. Yay. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone else? Tropical stuff so wacky. Totally wacky. Chegg, 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 Chegg. 
absolutely <laughs> you guys um kids pasta looking cooking ones don't know what that one was matthew but yes my lurker was buck mcadoo agaricus buck mcadoo eye is named after him oh nice i see your sarcus fair there damn you only drink beer out of it if you're willing to drink dirt too <laughs> and spores and spores yeah if you don't like bugs you should love these fungi you're totally right about that uh we talked about how do we know it's a go agaricus there's a relevant link i'll cut copy Eurytiol is in the cashew. Yes, that's the um, that's the Anacardiaceae uh, dermatitis inducing compound. And but but I guess I didn't know what part if it's it's in the fruit because like they eat the fruit juice. I don't know if the nut pod is covered in it. I touched the nut pod. I don't know. I've also haven't had a reaction from poison oak, but I don't touch it a lot either. So, um, Luca says siplop siplophis siplophis. What is that? I don't know. False flower. All right. Let's see. Lord is a mushroom goddess. Thank you. You know, that's sweet. Heard you can use glycerin. Never heard or tried to do glycerin preservation. Wow. Someone, Eileen says, thank you. It felt like I went on a journey this evening. That's, that's great. That's the goal and a uh, ton of information you're welcome incredible life forms okay was there talk amongst the groups you walked with about fungal bioprospecting in tropical areas slash south america in general um ethics nationalism conservation versus exploitation um fungal bioprospecting like looking for fungi to, to develop into medicines and stuff i'm imagining i um Wait, wow, the spore, the cup is sporulating. Is that a video? That's your, <laughs> sorry, I'm very distractible. There's a lot going on. Um, there wasn't much talk about that because uh, Kathy's work is so based on the fungal, the plant pathogens that it's really more looking at like her funding goes into like, how do we save these crops? And uh, like coffee rust was one that she's been on top of since it before it became a global issue. And she was trying to get funding for it but way before it boomed and nobody would give her money. And then, uh, you know, she warned everybody and then it became a huge problem. And then she got a million dollars to do it. So it's like after it had already jumped continents and such. So it's sad but most of her work goes into just like how like not even I mean yeah I didn't get to see the work of like what do we do how do we help save things what do we what do we engineer to or do to protect these crops and stuff we more were just collecting leaves with rusts and you know macro fungi micro fungi anything it was very based on like field collection getting stuff described getting stuff into a um solution that we could preserve to then get dna sequencing done and then drying a specimen and and like that's the baseline if you're going to do anything with the fungi if it's you're going to use it for medicine if you're going to use it to um you know understand plant paths it's like you have to have it described to science in order to then you know that's the foundation then you look at how do we what do we know about its life cycle what do we know about you know how it spreads because rusts have um, an interesting life cycle. They have a dual host system where they have a one host for um, an asexual part of their life and one host for sexual. And I think it gets more complicated than that. And anyways, there's just, yeah, no, that, that was a long way to answer your question. I don't think that that was discussed. It's something I've thought about, um, but I haven't talked to too many people about it. Ethics, nationalism conservation versus exploitation yeah it's very non-exploitative I would say the work that we were doing so it wasn't something but we did talk about how other researchers have gone in and they'll they'll take specimens out of the country and um, if the laws don't keep you from doing that then it's really easy to just get all this credit for um, you know taking stuff out of a country that you didn't work with the people who are from there you didn't give them credit you you know you didn't give them a chance to be part to a participant in the work 
And so now there are laws. And if anybody knows the name of those laws, I forgot the name. It's like the international, um, I don't think it's the the IUCN or or the, I don't think it's the, the taxonomical um, group, but there's, there's a research institution that has put out laws for people. So if you can't publish a, a paper with a specimen from a country that you took that hasn't doesn't have a voucher that's also present in that country. Um, and there's a bunch of other rules too. Um, I can dig up that paper. Let's see. Mimosa, <laughs> the mimosa plants those are bean fabicia uh, the mimosoid group clan clade um those are like the sensitive plants and stuff can you expand on the bees and the stinkhorn uh i just kind of saw them there they ate the gleba they ate the spore stinky spore mass i think they were bees i thought they were flies at first but then i think we looked closer and realized that they were actually bees and like there were no insects or anyone on the mushroom when I saw it on the way in and then on the way out there was just a lot of it had been eaten and there was just a bunch of bees just all over um the mushroom so that's all I know about that Use these IDs. Oh, discoveries to go after no novel compounds. Yeah, I, all I know is that Kathy's work isn't doing that, going going after you know novel compounds, but um, it is being done. And I I also do work collecting specimens that go to that purpose as well as one of my jobs. And so it's something that is taken seriously and is talked about, and that I and clear about hoping is, you know, used responsibly and it's all permitted and it's all in this country. So other companies doing it, I don't know about other research. I don't know about Nagoya protocol. Thank you, Richard. That's what it's called. If you want to look into those rules. Um, I eat cashew fruits frozen too mushy when thawed and they're safe. Find them in a Latin market freezer. Oh, cool. Frozen cashew fruit. That sounds great. But that's part of why cashews are so expensive is they like only make one nut pod, like one nut per fruit. So you need like so much of it to make like a bag of cashews. I love seeing this scene. You guys, oh, hi. Oh my God, it's like Grace and Jorge and Sumika. <laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> Hi friends. Hey. Hello. Hello. Lovely. You guys, you guys chilling. Oh, thanks. Yeah, great job. That was awesome. We, we wanted to ask you, what was your favorite mushroom that you found down there? Or your favorite find or both or, you know, non-mushroom non is cool. Oh God. Uh, I really loved that dwarf tiger tarantula that I got to hold because I never thought I'd ever hold a tarantula and it had a pink heart on its butt. And so that was adorable. And it was just like this big. That might have been my favorite non mushroom. Um, those. Hmm. The, the favalasha were really cool. A lot of the wax caps were really awesome and the clubs and my I think my favorite was like the half like the the flat headed hygrosity that was like a pin with veins that one I think was my favorite mushroom and Kathy's like never seen anything like it so I was like cool um the meatballs the tremelogasters those are cool um my caloderma, my blue entoloma that I like almost stumbled on. And it was funny because we were so exhausted. And I had been saying, I hope I see a blue mushroom. And then I just looked down and I was like, Jack was next to me. And I just go, I didn't say we hadn't been talking about it. And I just go, there it is. And I just like picked it. And I was like, I wasn't very enthusiastic because we were so exhausted. But and he'll still laugh at that because he's never seen me so unenthused by finding something I was hoping to find. Um, yeah. So thanks for asking. Um, oh, 
Speaking of Jack, I, I don't want to cut things off. I just wanted to. Oh, no, we're way past our time anyways. We're, we're, we're past our time, but I don't mind. It looks like you're having a bit of a reunion here, too. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I hope everyone can join us uh, uh, Tuesday night for Jack's Talk mm -hmm. on Unusual Fungi and Where yes. to Find Them. I guess this is a Fantastic Beasts fan. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. So any, anyhow, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, yeah, yeah, for coming and joining our club and anyone who wants to hang on can, can keep, keep chatting. <laughs>